which makes democracy work properly and this is the force behind progressive social change keeping this vision and mission in mind in 1965 this imc was founded and today our foundation lecture for this lecture we have with us editorial director itv network shri madhav das nalapat give him a big round of applause once again We are honored to have you here, sir. I would invite our DG, sir, to please give the welcome address and introduce the guest, DG, sir. A very good morning to all of you. Respected Professor Nalpat, Dean Academics, Professor Vijay Parmar. esteemed family uh, faculty members and uh, dj scholars indian information service officer trainees and dear students and other guests who are present here it's indeed a great honor for us today i was a little skeptical since yesterday because uh, our former prime minister is in a critical condition and uh, so we were all keeping our fingers crossed because if anything unfortunate had happened we would have had to cancel this program uh but fortunately may god give him a long life we pray for his long life and uh, good health so foundation day lectures are a very important part of our annual our academic session a long way it's not easy for any institution to maintain the same standards the same standards of excellence continuously for over 5 decades and today when this year once again india today declared us as india's best mass communication institute the week hansa survey once again declared us as india's best mass communication institute reiterated our position as not just india's best mass communication institute but one of the world's best mass communication institutes and that is why for the since 1969 we have trained over 1600 mid career journalists from 128 countries i don't know how many of our new students have gone through our vision statement our vision statement is that the indian institute of mass communication will set global standards for media education research extension and training using state of the art technology for building a knowledge driven information society contributing to human development empowerment and participatory democracy anchored in pluralism universal values and ethics and our mission statement is to create a dynamic learning and working environment which nurtures new ideas creativity research and scholarship and develops leaders and innovators in the domain of media and mass communication and i am happy to share with you that we have created leaders not just in the domain of media and mass communication but also different disciplines today we have our alumni who are heading leading ngos in this country who are in key positions in government and in governments across the world including the uzbekistan ambassador to india we certainly our students are among the top journalists in this country i don't want to take specific names because i believe they are all doing extremely well and so on. we are working in that that towards realization of that vision statement as you are all aware that so we have five campuses initially we used to refer to them as centers but in the last 2 and a half years 
we have renamed them as regional campuses. We had acquired our own two land, but uh, at two places, land at two places, but they were under a stay. We got the stay vacated, and in two years, we have built beautiful campuses in Kotayam, Kerala. We hope that the current flood situation in Kerala eases and uh, the people get relief. And our, the program to inaugurate that campus, that's going to happen soon. Our, as all, our campus has come up very beautifully. And in two other places, Amravati and Jammu, we have acquired land and construction work has already begun in Jammu. A lot of independence, autonomy, you know, that's being done. So, uh, you know, is able, they are able to achieve whatever has been given in this, the mandate given to us. We are not just confining at IIMC, we have started the Community Radio Empowerment and Resource Center. We have started the National Media Faculty Development Center. We have tied up with... We have collaborations with the different national and international institutions. Our publications, our quarterly publications, are today in great demand. They are UGC-approved, peer-reviewed journals. Our publication division has bounced back. And very soon, you are going to have our first publication which will be launched and we will be back again with the best textbooks, with the best books in the field of mass communication. So sir, we are on that journey and we need the support because our USP has always been this industry interface. And we are grateful to you, to people like you in the profession who have guided us, who have mentored us and that is why you have helped us, our students, reach, you know, their pinnacle only because of your blessings. It's indeed a matter of great honor today that a veteran uh, journalist and academician like Professor Nalapat is in our midst today to deliver the Foundation Day lecture. Last year we had Mr. Arnab Goswami and last to last year we had Mr. Rajat Sharma. And this year, Professor Nalapad is not only one of the finest journalists in this country, but also has been a guide and mentor to me. He is currently editorial director of the Sunday Guardian and ITV network. He is the vice chair of Manipal University's advanced research group and director of the Department of Geopolitics at Manipal University. In fact, he is India's first professor of geopolitics. He had earlier edited, so he is an equal authority in both language journalism and English journalism. He has edited one of India's, you know, leading regional publications in Malayalam. He has been the editor of Madhra Bhumi and later he was associated with the Times of India. Uh, he became editor of Madhra Bhumi in 1984 and uh, in 1989 he shifted from Malayalam to English language journalism becoming the resident editor of the Times of India at Bangalore. In 1994 he moved to Delhi as resident editor of the Times of India in Delhi. He also worked as Chief of News Bureau in 1995 to 1997 before becoming contributing editor uh, in, towards end 1998 to concentrate on writing. As I said that uh, uh, he is also a distinguished fellow of the University of Georgia. He has contributed to leading publications throughout the world and has written six books including Indutva, I-N-D-U-T-V-A, whose central thesis is that every Indian is a synthesis of Vedic, Mughal and Western cultural DNA. And religious exclusivism goes against the, this ethos of fusion. Apart from his work, he has played 
a key role in the literacy movement in Kerala as the first honorary coordinator of the Kerala Association for Non-Formal Education and Development. He was also the honorary secretary of the Kerala Children's Film Society, which screens educational films for children. He has been active in environmental issues and he has been associated with many other organizations uh, you know, uh, in the state of Kerala. The inspiration of the editor's character in the Malayalam movie Vartha can be traced to him. And uh, well, I have a long list of his affiliations including he is the foreign policy expert for Gateway House the Indian Council on Global Relations, member of the advisory board of India, China and American Institute at Georgia, member of the resource board of the Center for International Relations, Washington DC, distinguished fellow of CITS, the University of Georgia, uh, and uh, you know, so many institutions. To give it an insight into his personal background, well, he was born to K. Madhav Das and the renowned Malayalam and English writer Kamala Das. And uh, he, he is married to Princess Rani Lakshmi Bai of the Royal House of Travancore. He's a gold medalist in economics from the University of Mumbai. In fact, when we put that poster of him as the editorial director of ITV Network and Sunday Guardian, you know, he said that, well, I would have preferred if you had given my academic credentials. So, he's a passionate academician. Thank you, sir, for being with us today. And I'm sure that our students would be enlightened by your experiences that you're going to share with us today. Thank you so much. I think that I'm very proud of being a journalist. And I'm delighted that through the ITV network, I can continue my, my work in journalism. It's been a very important uh, aspect of my, my life and my work. And I'm truly delighted to continue in it. And I'm also very happy to accept your invitation today in this very hallowed institution. Thank you, Director General, and thank you, Professor Parmar, and the distinguished faculty and students here. Now, I'm going to speak as a professional newsman or a professional journalist. It's not going to be a quote-unquote academic speech for simple reason that I believe that the library of life we have, and including a lot of discussion on the media, where even professionals speak in a way which is wholly abstract and academic. Let me put this whole thing in a context. And the context is, what exactly why is the field that you have chosen, communications, so very important in the life of any country that you are a part of? Because to some of us, communications would be almost like the kidneys of a nation state. It clean, cleanses impurities from the bloodstream. And the bloodstream is the bloodstream of policy. The bloodstream is the bloodstream of governance. And the job of the kidney is to identify impurities in that bloodstream and get those impurities removed. In the case of a democracy, through transparency about those impurities and therefore the removal of those responsible for those impurities from the bloodstream of governance. It's an extremely important function across the world because if impurities remain, the overall health of the nation state suffers very grievously. The more effectively the kidneys work, the more healthy one is as a human being, and the more, uh, more the, 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 all the organs of the body are able to function, because the bloodstream of governance is important in every aspect of our lives. Wherever we, you know, we, we are active in, where we live in, where we discuss matters in, governance is always there as a constant shadow. And therefore, cleansing this blood of governance, this blood, blood stream of governance is extremely important and that is your role as people who are involved in the business of communications. I repeat, you are in fact what the kidneys play in the human body, you are playing in the body of the nation state. Now, 
we are meeting i mean your you know your founders decided to wait until the country a day after the country became independent to set you up so you were set up not on the 15th of august but the the, the day after well i'd like to you know say that yes 15th august 1947 we got freedom from the british but the point of that matter is what exactly is this freedom that is so precious it's not simply that a bunch of people went away it's also in a in a in a very deep sense the freedom to think the freedom to talk the freedom to work the freedom to play the freedom to dress the freedom to eat the freedom to live life all these freedoms are part and parcel of what we would call the freedoms in a democracy and on and the 15th of august 1947 is basically when we talk about freedom coming on that day the fact of the matter is that it's still a work in progress 72 years later in the 72nd year that all the freedoms associated with genuine independence the freedoms that we see for example in evolved democracies and some freedoms of course that we don't see there but we see here some freedoms we don't see here we see there but it's very important to understand that freedom is indivisible freedom is something that cannot be segmented that cannot be firewalled and that cannot in a sense be prioritized freedom is ind is completely indivisible and for some people certain freedoms are important for other people other freedoms are important but it is the job of a democracy and it's very much the job of communication specialists in democracy to ensure that this freedom is maintained and strengthened why we are a country of 1.3 billion people we are on track to be the third biggest economy in the world uh, i mean we are now the sixth biggest now some would say that that is a matter for rejoicing some would say that you know until we are third we cannot rejoice but the fact of the matter is that we are on track but the, the our second point is there are approximately 380 million young indians today who are working in occupations or not working in occupations where their productive talents are fully utilized now if you were to compare the productivity of an average indian in let's say singapore a resident who is an ethnic indian in singapore a, re a resident of the united states a resident of canada a resident of the uk if we had even a fourth of the productivity of such individuals this country would not have been number 3 or number 6 but far and away number 1 in the global society of nations in terms of economic output so the question is we are the same people we have the same dna and i'm happy suresh mentioned my um, what i wrote about hindutva because my point is very simple the vedic period the mughal period and the british period are all three intrinsic parts of our national history and all three have had their impact on our culture on our society on our lifestyles on our mindsets so we cannot say we cannot fire all these three we have to in a sense accept and rejoice in a fusion of these three periods and ensure that the negatives in each of them are in a sense downsized in a sense made less toxic and the positives in each of them are made more evolved more stronger so that as a nation as a as a culture as a society and i'd like to say as a unified culture as a unified nation as a unified society we become far stronger to tackle the challenges and the, one of the crucial challenges is some 380 million young people who are either under underemployed or some of whom are unemployed if these people are not given gainful employment i'm not i'm not just talking about india here let's talk about afghanistan let's talk about pakistan let's talk about the gulf countries let's talk about you know africa let's talk about the entire world if we don't have systems in place for ensuring that these young people are able to develop themselves productively we are going to face extreme social tumult in india way back in the early 90s 
I used to predict that India is going to emerge as a great power, and a lot of people regarded that as almost laughable. They would say, well, this is nonsense. You know, it can't happen. This is India. It's never going to happen. But now almost everybody is talking about India as a great power. And frankly, it's very difficult to imagine I mean, any serious geopolitical expert not recognizing the fact that within about 17 or 16 or 24, depending on the quality of governance, we are going to be the third biggest economy in the world. China is going to be number one, United States second, and India third. And it's going to remain that way for a very considerable period of time in the 21st century. But what is the source of the jobs that we can create? We can talk about manufacturing, but the fact of the matter is manufacturing needs a in infrastructure in a very significant way. Unless you have significant infrastructure, you can't ramp up manufacturing to levels where we're talking of employing 100, 150 million people. China took about 20 years to develop that infrastructure, and today Chinese infrastructure is very advanced. In fact, it's in some respects much better than European or American infrastructure. You saw what happened in Italy, the bridge. I mean, it's not in India that this happened, it happened in Italy, a so-called uh, developed country. So, what is the way out? The way out is the knowledge economy. And it is here, frankly, that Indian talent, young, young Indian talent in particular, have an edge. Because in India, we are lucky to have a culture across the millennia, a culture that is accepting and a culture that is not really bound by very rigid doctrines. When you have a culture that's bound by very rigid doctrines, when you have a culture that's bound by a huge matrix and mesh of ritual, then the ability to think freely across, in a sense, different dimensions becomes much less. And in India, fortunately, we have an extremely syncretic culture a culture very accepting of differences, a culture rejoicing of differences, in fact. And this has enabled our minds to be absolutely world-class so far as the information age is concerned. It's not accidental that if you go to San Jose, for example, I mean, practically every other, uh, you know, good uh, company there is run by people who are either ethnic Indians or Indians who have become American citizens or who migrated to the United States long back. At one time it used to be a quarter, then a third. Today my guess is it's about 40% of the really important uh, you know, uh, uh, knowledge groups there. It's not an accidental that, for example, an alumnus of Manipal Institute of Technology, Satya Nadella, is now the head of Microsoft. It's not an accident. Satya is an Indian. Satya has an Indian mind. We are all Indian. I mean, you know, most of us are Indian here, and of course, uh, and we have our friends as well. But the fact is, the mind in this country has evolved across the centuries, across the millennia, to be an extremely versatile mind. Which means that the future is the service industry, is the knowledge industry. If, for example, a man, a boy of 16, 17, 18 can develop an app that can make him a dollar billionaire in three years' time. His brain is, you know, he's 16 years old or 18 years old or 20 years old, but he can develop an app. So we have to create the systems in India. We have to create the foundation in India in which such an app can be developed and such an app, in a sense, can be worked out and given to society so that this person becomes a billionaire and in the process makes some of us billionaires and others having $100,000, others $1,000, but spreads the benefits of technology. If you have a really good high-tech operation, you'll have a minimum of 400, 500,000 jobs working, getting derived from that high-tech operation. So the way forward is through the knowledge economy. And the knowledge economy means a culture of freedom, a culture of acceptability, a culture of tolerance for different points of view. And that is where you come in as communication experts. Because don't build Chinese walls. You know, don't build walls in between, uh, if I may say so, different dimensions, different cultures, different 
fates or different anything because these kind of things are extremely harmful to the development of the practical manifestations, to the operationalization of the unique mindset that we have in India, a mindset that is completely and wholly syncretic, a mindset that is wholly tolerant and accepting. It's very important to ensure that such a, that, the, the, uh, that we ensure that this kind of an attitude functions in safety because that's the only way forward for the massive leaps in knowledge technology that we need in India if we are to ensure that hundreds of millions of people are going to be gainfully, productively and profitably employed. I come from private sector organizations. I've been in private sector organizations all my life. I don't believe profit is a, you know, is a negative word. I think it's a very good word. So then, as I said, we come back to the subject for which, you know, the DG invited me here, which is basically fake news and post-truth, etc. Well, I'd like to talk about a country that I've visited, you know, sometimes in the past, and which I saw completely melt down and disintegrate as a country. Why? Because I wanted to tell that what happened to that country can happen to any country. Any country. It can even happen to so-called developed countries in Europe. It can happen to parts of North America. It can very well happen here in South Asia. And that country is Syria. In around 2010, around 2011, we, if you look at YouTube, if you look at all that, a huge number of images got, got uh, streamed onto that which showed the government of Syria, a government headed by a gentleman called Bashar Assad. And frankly, I'm not an admirer of the Assad family. I think they have been far too uh, nepotistic. I think there have been a lot of corruption, a lot of incompetence. But it showed them, in a sense, this entire government as being against religion, of basically saying that you know, Hafez Assad is like a god, that Bashar Assad is the son of God, all kinds of things in which people who are supposed to be Syrian and who are supposed to be supporting Bashar Assad were saying. It was toxic. It was hugely toxic. Long back I remember my uncle used to work in Shiraz in Iran and there it was not fake news. It was real news. And the real news was they used to show the Shah of Iran drinking uh, you know, a glass of wine or a bit of whiskey in parties very openly. They would show Queen Faradiba dancing with Americans and Europeans fairly openly without any concept of what the impact this is going to be on the society in Iran. We all know what happened of, with those images of the Shah and Faradiba and all that. And I can tell you those were not false images. My uncle who was in Shiraz, who loves the Iranian people, one of the most talented and gifted people in the world, told me that this is exactly what the Shah did. And he obviously either didn't care or didn't really realize the impact of these images. But the images which were shown on YouTube were almost entirely untrue. They were created to create disaffection and anger against the Assad family out of all proportion to what happened and to create, in a sense, a situation in which, like in Afghanistan, people were incentivized to take up arms in the feeling that something very precious to them was not only under threat, was being humiliated and insulted daily. So what happened in Syria after 2011, 2012, 2013? It's a rolling tragedy. Today there is no Syria. Syria is gone. I don't believe as a geopolitical uh, student that uh, that country can ever be put back together. It's gone. Libya is gone. Iraq is half gone. Afghanistan is half gone. Many of these countries are almost beyond repair. And in every one of these countries, from both sides, there were fake images, fake documentaries. I mean, you remember, for example, the Kuwaiti ambassador's child was put as some victim of Saddam Hussein. Well, Saddam Hussein was a dictator, an intolerant dictator, there's no doubt about it. He was very friendly to India. And I remember, for example, when the, you know, when the ter terror attack took place in Mumbai, the, we asked all over the world for information that could help us against these terrorists. Only one country gave us information, and that was Iraq under Saddam Hussein. No other country gave it to us. So I'd like to say that he was a friend of India. A good friend of mine. But 
at the same time, you know, the, the kind of, again, the kind of, you know, imagery, the kind of things that were put about him, the kind of things that, these were out of all proportion to the truth. And today, a large number of that is circulating even now on YouTube, on Facebook, and all these things. And these were made to create certain mood, a certain, if I may say so, anger, a certain level of frustration. And what is worrying me is, it's, you can see some of that, some of those kind of images also circulating in media, in social media, and mainstream media, if I may say so, all across in India, it's happening there. What happened in Syria, I watch very closely. Uh, Iran, not so much, but Libya, again, closely, but not, not directly there. And I am worried because, you know, even if, if there are 1% of the kind of images that were made in Syria, it would be relatively easy for a small group of people to create mayhem and havoc in a society by circulating pictures, by circulating images, by circulating voices, which would go to show that governments or civil society are acting in a particular way. I don't just, I'm not, you know, saying that this is happening against governments. It's sometimes, in some segments, it happens against governments. In some segments, it happens against civil society. In some segments, it happens against, you know, individual people of some of gender or particular groups. But there is no doubt that it's become amazingly easy in this age of morphing of images, of morphing of photographs, to create any image you want about anybody. I mean, I know in my own case, I found that I had somebody check my computer and I found that somebody had gone and hacked into it and if anybody checked that computer, that person would think that I am spending a lot of time on a lot of uh, uh, websites which uh, frankly I, have, I, mean, uh, I had no knowledge of. So, if you were to look into my computer, as a result of that hacking, you would come to conclusions about my browsing history, which are entirely different from the actual browsing history. I did check some of those web websites later, Suresh, I must confess, but I don't think I found them attractive enough to continue with them. But I just like to say that it is so easy, and God knows who did it. God knows why they did it. But it happened. It's, it was there in my machine. And it could still be there on my machine for all I know, and it's so easy. You cannot stop the march of technology if you want to evolve into a global knowledge hub. It's not possible. Two, you cannot muzzle freedom of expression if you want to evolve into a global knowledge hub. But you have to ensure that people are, in a sense, inoculated to understand what is fake, what is motivated, what is derived from what is not. It's not always easy, it's not always possible. But people have also got to understand the very dire consequences that they can face if it is not clearly mentioned. It's a huge difference in the way they fought. In India in the old days, only certain groups of people were allowed to bear arms. Others were not given the right to train and bear arms. And I think that that very wrong decision of saying that, you know, prowess in military, in the military field depends on the accident of birth played a very key role in what happened in India over, the, over about a millennia. And that is takeover by external powers who were far less, in a sense, economically developed, but who had societal structures that enabled them to be far more successful in military operation than the structures that were there in India. Now we have to acknowledge the defects in these structures. We have to say very clearly these structures were defective and these things happened as a result. You cannot run away from that knowledge. At the same time, I want to say very clearly that the good news is that, you know, overall we have managed to continue and do as a society, as a kind as a society which is completely in sync with the tenet of if I may say so, Sanatan Dharma. And what is that tenet? That tenet is all paths lead to the same goal. The core of Sanatan Dharma means all paths lead to the same goal. I remember when I wanted to go to Saudi Arabia, I was invited to open a Madhimam newspaper there. And they, it was, they were very specific 
that I should mention my, my faith in my passport applic in application for a visa. I said Sanatan Dharma. And I think the embassy was a bit confused. They didn't know what this was. But I said that's what I believe in. And it's such a unique uh, philosophy. It's such a wonderful philosophy. It's a philosophy which says every, the path that you use, fine. It's your path. You use it because eventually it leads to the same goal. And what is that goal? That goal is some an appreciation, if not an understanding, of the common supreme force that guides all our activity. Uh, whether you call it the Almighty, whatever name you call it, the Gayatri Mantra, for example, talks about the supreme being. Uh, an appreciation of that supreme being. So whichever the road you travel by, 360 degrees you can approach that particular concept and those 360 degrees, each of them will have in according to this ancient Indian tradition, equal relevance. I think that's very important and I think that kind of 360 degree freedom to think, that 360 degree ability to analyze, not shutting off, not firewalling any kind of, you know, uh, any cultural or scholastic or other kind of, of traditions is extremely important to knowledge economy because frankly, Knowledge economy is very, very important in today's world. And I repeat, I am, and pardon me for saying so, an old-fashioned nationalist. I believe, I mean, with, I know, I, I, am a, I, mean, I may be a UNESCO professor, I may be traveling around the world, I may be giving lectures in different countries, but I love this country, and I, I am, I'm not going to exchange my passport for any other. You know, even if I have to use most of it for all kinds of visa forms that I won't, if I, for example, if I were a citizen of Tonga, I would have visa free entry to more than 100 countries. I don't have that in India, but I'm fine. I, I don't mind that at all. But the reality of the situation is, frankly, this nationalism, what does it mean? It means wanting this country to progress. And how do we progress? We progress by ensuring that the mindsets, we protect the mindsets that embrace freedom. We protect the mindsets that embrace diversity. We protect the mindsets that accept the traditional culture of Sanatan Dharma and we do not try and narrow down, if I may say so, like narrowing of the arteries, you know. If you narrow the arteries, you end up having a heart attack. So we do, should not narrow the arteries of inquiry the arteries of knowledge and in that if I may say so healthy communications healthy activity on the part of communications healthy activity on people who are involved in the business of communication is extremely important as I repeat you are the kidneys working to flush out toxins and what are these toxins these toxins are impurities in the bloodstream of governance what are impurities those who look upon governance as a means of self-enrichment, as a means of enriching themselves, their family, their friends, rather than anybody else. Now, I've written some pretty uh, strong comments in my time about some individuals. And one of the individuals I, I, I wrote about, my problem with that individual was that, prob was that, like many other people, that individual cared for more for the immediate family of the individual than the entire country. More was done for the single family of that individual than for the entire country in terms of the mind of the individual and the decisions that that individual pushed. Now that's wrong. Because once you come to power, once you come to authority, you have to think about the country. And if you don't think about the country, the searchlight of the media, of public inquiry has got to shine on you. Now I want to say that in one respect, I am certainly not the best person to invite you here because I found it very difficult to hold on to my job as an editor in at least two or three instances because I was a little, if I may say so, transparent in my writing and it was not fully appreciated by people. So I think Suresh is aware of some of them. But I'm, I'm very happy about that. I have no regrets about that at all. And if I were asked to do the same thing all over again, I will continue to do what I've been doing now. And again, for example, I'll give you a simple example. I firmly believe that I am a secular fundamentalist. It is as a secular fundamentalist that I firmly believe that it's important that you have the Ram Janabhumi, the Krishna, Krishna Janabhastan, 
and Varanasi, the ancient temple at Varanasi, that these three be restored. Because what happens is, if that happens, any effort to create a culture of intolerance, to create a culture of division will fail. And the essential moderation of the country, the essential strength of Sanatan Dharma will emerge in its full glory. So in my view, this is a precondition for that mindset to, to be strong and to be strengthened. So as a secular person, I strongly, in a sense, believe that if the, the laws of the country are such, it should be followed uniformly. And it should not be followed you know, in bits and pieces. Now you have people from America, people from Europe, people from other parts of the world coming and saying, oh my God, you're an intolerant country. You're talking of something like a uniform civil code. Well, which country in Europe does not have a uniform civil code? Which country in North America does not have a uniform civil code? Every one of them do. Because, let's face it, I don't like to pay taxes. I'm sorry, I have to pay them. But I have to pay my taxes. I don't like many of the laws of this country. Because unfortunately, the old colonial laws have continued. And may I remind you, these laws were created by the British for a slave people. Those who came after 1947 have happily retained these laws because it gives them vast power. Whether they are politicians, whether they are civil servants, they still maintain these colonial laws because it gives them vast power and they enjoy having this vast power over citizens. In my view, we are never going to unlock our full potential until civil society is fully involved in the bloodstream of governance. Whether, if, for example, you know, in, you know, whether it's, for example, in, you know, recruiting people to various ministries, at least a certain portion, one third, should be from civil society. And you should have that constant free flow to civil society and the civil service rather than an inbred system because inbreeding is very negative. I don't, I'm not a student of biology, but everybody, every biologist I've met tell me inbreeding is terrible. And if you have a civil service that's completely inbred, and we have other institutions of governance that are completely inbred, it can't be healthy for the nation state. And it's not healthy. So I would like to see civil society expand. And I'm again proud of the fact I had never been part of the civil service. I've always been a part of, of civil society. And I'm delighted by it, quite frankly. And I think that's very important. And I request all of you to understand that. Because today, Back 20 years ago, I talked about India developing as a superpower. I can tell you that, you know, yes, I'm still very hopeful about that happening. But there are some problems and there are some efforts, there are some issues which can create a situation in which, I'm not saying that we are going to go into a meltdown, but it can create situations that are highly and hugely, in a sense, uh, you know, difficult to face. Now, in Punjab, for example, when KPS Gill came as the DGP of police, all the security around the DGP were people who were not members of the Sikh community. Mr. Gill said nonsense. From the first minute that he was the DGP of police, he said, I'll have only Sardars as my security. Nobody else. No person who's not a Sikh will be part of my security. I trust them. They are my people. I trust them. And believe me, I can tell you, it's KPS Gill who did an enormous amount to ensure that the menace of Pakistan-sponsored terrorism was demolished in Punjab. Go on to Kashmir. There was a time when Kashmiris were, in the, in the, you know, up 91, 92, uh, when there were, when people, when, when a Kashmiri came to you and said, look, I want to rent a shop, I want to rent a flat, I want to get admission in the college, there was some problem, you know, well, you know, we, we're not sure. A clear signal was given by Prime Minister P. V. Narsimha. I know that because Mr. Narsimharao was known to me, I knew him very well, that look, make the, the citizens of India who are Kashmiris welcome across the country. And today, across the country, you have Kashmiris living, working, shops, establishments, everything else. And I think that was a very important decision, to trust your people and trust them to migrate anywhere in the country, have the same rights as anybody else. And I think that should apply, of course, to every part of India that every Indian should have the same right to migrate or to settle anywhere else. But that was very helpful in ensuring that this kind of Pakistan-sponsored thing that we saw there 
came down significantly in intensity. So I just like to point out, whenever we have followed policies suited to our ethos of tolerance, suited to our ethos of syncretic culture, suited to our ethos of, of a moderate spirit, we have always done well as a nation, as a nation state, as a people. You know, and I think hopefully in the future as well, that same situation will take place. If it is to take place, I can tell you, the media is going to have to play a very important role in that. The communications industry is going to have to play a very important role in that. And I want to end this by talking about the United States, because the US is regarded as the epitome of democracy. What's happening in the US today? You know, some of us like this uh, thing of the Lutean's Delhi, and some of us have written some pretty nasty things about Lutean's Delhi. Some of it is deserved, some of it may not be. Washington, you got something called the Washington Beltway. Now, President Trump has refused to appoint people from the Beltway to more than about one third of the jobs in his administration, whom he has appointed. One thing about President Trump, he has not appointed about 70% or 75% of the jobs he can appoint are yet to be appointed because he doesn't believe in big government, he wants smaller government. So I'm not going to name some of the other media outlets that have been extremely one-sided and nasty towards Trump, mainly because the Washington Beltway is trying its level best to remove him so they can get employed. You know, and of course I don't blame them. I mean, it was terrible. You know, waiting, waiting, waiting for a job, it never comes. It must be horrible. But, and, and with Trump, it's likely not to come because Trump doesn't really believe government's important. What has Trump done? In the US administration, you have the president, you have the secretaries of the departments, and then you have what I would call the political bureaucracy. That is bureaucracy appointed by the president. Almost all these political bureaucrats are people with agendas of their own, mindsets of their own, policies of their own. So the result is, when they come in, there's confusion in policy. What Trump has done is almost significantly eliminate this political bureaucracy by just not hiring people. So as a consequence, what he wants is communicate to secretaries, and the secretaries are usually ex-military, ex-private ex company, and the private company and the military, you know, the instinct is to obey orders. So then it goes to the permanent bureaucracy, which is good at obeying orders. So that, that political bureaucracy layer, which basically you know, puts their own agenda into the president's agenda, into the Republican agenda, is eliminated. And as a consequence, frankly, if you go to the United States, so many newspapers are talking that the whole country is in a state of meltdown, chaos, but all the indexes are the country is making great progress, economic growth is high, uh, unemployment is low, and things are doing pretty well. So if you go and you talk to people in the government, whether it is uh, you know, one department or the other, commerce or Pentagon or whatever, it's functioning very smoothly without these political bureaucrats. But there's a huge farago against Donald Trump. Now, it's no secret that the people who are pro-Trump are also giving a huge farago against their enemies. So you have fake news on both sides. But I want to end by saying, ladies and gentlemen, fake news, alternative facts, post-truth, has been a fact of life throughout human history, especially during tense times and situations of social conflict. And my big worry today is that we are seeing a rise in toxicity in social media especially and also in, part, in the parts of the mainstream media. Uh, a rise in the decibel of abuse, a rise in the decibel level of complete rejection, that we are seeing that happen, and it's not just on one side, it's happening on both sides. I'd like to say very frankly that some of us, um, in my own case, I'd like to say that for a, for a, for a, for a long time, I could, I was, it was almost impossible, impossible almost, to get published in India because I was writing things against a particular leader. For a long time, it was impossible to get published in India. Ultimately, I got published in two publications, The Organizer of the RSS and Radiance of Jamaat -e Islam. So I think I am the only human being who has written for both Radiance and Organizer. I'm very happy about that. But that is about the only publication I could write in. Now, I do know a few words of English. I do have a few thoughts of my own. 
I think I'm not that negative that all the hundreds of publications in India will feel that my writing is so third rate, I shouldn't be published for, for a decade, but it happened. So let's face it, intolerance is not something that began on a particular date. It's been there all through. I remember A.D. Gorwala. A.D. Gorwala used to write a column in the Times of India called Vivek in the 1950s. Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru said that this column should be stopped and Bennett Coleman stopped the column. It was again during 1952, and I'm not going to mention who the Prime Minister was that period, who introduced severe limitations on freedom of speech. What I want to say is, freedom of speech is a requisite for the knowledge economy. Knowledge economy is a requisite for the double-digit growth of which India is potential capable of. And double-digit growth is a requisite to avoid unbearable social tension and and unbearable other tensions in India. So frankly, in all these processes, I'd like to say, I hope you guys come down on the side of the right side, which is frankly the side which in a sense ensures that the function which is done by the kidneys of identifying those who are in a sense impurities in the bloodstream of governance get identified and get removed. I'd like to say, I played my own small role in identifying some and getting some removed. Not enough, but I hope all of you will play that role. And if that role is played, we'll have a much better country and a much better world. Thank you.